Today, it is all about the wine. From the climate to the landscape, pruning the delicate grapevines to harvesting, processing, fermentation, and the bottling, this episode has it all. We are visiting the top award-winning winery in the state of Michigan. Once you have a chance to watch, you'll see why. I bet you even recognize the name. Where are we? You'll have to stick around to find out. It's wine time. I'm Adrian Sharp, and this is Food Circus. We are at St. Julian Winery in Paw Paw, Michigan, located on the corner of Kalamazoo and Commercial Street. The family-owned establishment takes winemaking to the next level. Whether you want to join their wine club, step in for a tasting, or take part in an educational tour, the employees here at St. Julian Winery will show you and your friends the ins and outs of this ancient process. By glancing at the awards section of their winery, there is no convincing necessary that they know their wines. You are all in for a very special experience. Now before we start the winemaking process, we need to take a look around the vineyards and see what they're all about and the different varieties of grapes that they offer. So Nancy Oxley and Rick Collett are gonna show us around. Hello everybody, uh, Rick Collett here with Food Circus. I'm here today with Nancy Oxley, uh, one of the, the head winemaker here at St. Julian Winery. So I wanna thank you for inviting us out. Thank you. We thought with uh, April being Michigan Wine Month that we'd take a little bit of time and come out uh, and show what uh, we think is one of the top wineries in the state of Michigan, one of the oldest family wineries. And the nice thing about it is we're using Michigan products to make the grapes. So we thought no better place to start than just coming right out in the vineyards themselves. So Nancy, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about where we're at and what these are? We are just south of Lawton, Michigan in southwest Michigan. We are in the heart of the Michigan wine country as we call it here in southwest Michigan. Uh, Lake Michigan is about 18 miles uh, just over the ridge over okay. here and so we have that great buffer to buffer our mm -hmm. weather, huge mm -hmm. bodies of water, um, have our lake protection, our lake effective protection. So mm -hmm. we're in this vineyard, this is our Deshaunac vineyard grown by Ed Oxley Farms and this is the primary varietal that's in our Simply Red wine. Uh, we also use this as a base wine for our sangria that we had taste or we're going to be tasting and uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's really kind of a neat operation. And what I really like about it is, you know, you see the trellising situation where you got a single row on top. So now you're going to train these vines to work right along here is what we're going to do. This is a top wire cordon, as we call it. So it's a very common trellising system that we use for our American, uh, French American hybrid grapes. So okay. you see that the main cane is up here on this top wire. And then these canes will actually droop down and the fruit will remain right here in this mid fruiting area. So by the leaves coming down nice and long, you have a nice solar panel mm -hmm. of uh, foliage that actually produces mm -hmm. that, uh, sugars when the grapes are formed. So we're, we're right here in March and you can see our little buds. <laughs> yeah, we were talking earlier. I mean, usually this is uh, four to six weeks before it's at this stage usually. Absolutely. Uh, it's amazing with this kind of spring that we've had this year how everything is coming out so early this year along the way. Now we're gonna see the simple differences from one side of the vineyard to the next, how the grapes are grown and what varieties they offer. Well, Nancy, we've kind of moved across the road and up the hill and we've kind of come into a different part of the vineyard now. And just by looking at the grapes already, you see there's a whole different thing going on here. And you told me these were uh, what type of grapes now? These are Chardonnay grapes. Okay. So now we're talking a completely different style. We're coming up the hill now, a little bit different structure now. These vines look different at this stage because why? <laughs> uh, these vines are different at this stage because usually in March we have some nice cool weather, usually doesn't get over 50 degrees. So the crews are out hand pruning all of the grapes this time of year. Mm -hmm. Well, Mother Nature surprised us with some warm weather. So these actually haven't been pruned yet. So the crews will come in here and prune back about four to five uh, little buds that you'll see on here. And that's how the actual vine will start. Uh, this is at the end of harvest, how you see. So the trellis is going upward and mm -hmm. it's called a VSP, vertical shoot positioning. So a little bit different than the vines that we looked at earlier, the Chanak, where they're tall and droop over. These start the cane at the bottom and everything goes up. So your solar panel is actually up on top and the fruit will stay right down here in the fruiting zone. Just as Rick and Nancy stated, the amount of care it takes to reap a successful grape harvest is unbelievable. You need to take so many factors into account. The weather, 
the pruning and care of the plants themselves, lots of labor, trial and error, knowledge of different types of grapes, and the individual care each strain requires, and of course, the soil and landscape. This should allow you to enjoy wine on a completely new level. I know I do. Now, Angela Braganini from St. Julian Winery and Joel Peterson from Anderson Distributing Company are gonna to talk to us a little bit about the history of this vintage winery. Yes, uh, we, as I said before, we started in 1921 um, when my great-grandfather started the winery over in Windsor, Canada um, with the repeal of Prohibition, which was great for both of us. Um, he moved into Detroit, and in 1936, because it was easier, we were trucking on the fruit over from this side of the state, he decided it'd be easier to move the winery to the fruit instead of moving the fruit to the winery. So we've been in this location here in Pawpaw since 1936, and it is actually a redone um, ice house, which we can show you more later on. But that's how we found this location, and we've been here ever since. It's a fantastic location. Obviously, you've got a lot of history on the walls here in the uh, in, in your restaurant area. But I see all the wine presses. You know any stories about the? Uh, I think your dad said he's trying to collect all the wine presses from everybody so they can make wine at home. But yes, uh, <laughs> uh, he's taking that out of all the home winemakers. But all these wine presses right now, we currently have 82. Um, it's just my dad's hobby. He mm -hmm. loves to collect them, so they're they're impressive. Great, great, and obviously some of the old labels, bottles from years past the St. Julian. It's uh, quite a collection. If you can see how the labels have changed over the years, we've actually gone back to some of the retro labels, uh, like Simply Red and some of our fan favorites. We haven't even changed the label because we haven't needed to, but it's interesting to see how they've progressed and changed over the years. Certainly. And obviously people can stop in the tasting room. Um, is it open every day of the week? Yep, we have uh, five locations. We have one in Dundee, one in Frankenmuth, one in Union Pier, one in South Haven, that's seasonal, and then here the home is the winery in Papa, where we're open seven days a week at all locations, and in Papa we do tours seven days a week, and at all locations you can do tasting and try all the new things that we have to offer. Super, I'm looking forward for the tour. We're gonna pause for station identification, but this wild ride is just getting started. When we return, it's Sipping and Tipping with Joel Peterson. And later, the tour continues with my favorite part, oh, well, maybe at the end, the taste test. Stay tuned. Welcome to Sipping and Tipping. We're here at downtown Paw Paw celebrating Michigan Wine Month here in April. We're at the beautiful St. Julian Winery, uh, the number one winery in Michigan. We're here with Angela Braganini, fourth generation um, wine owner, and uh, Nancy Oxley, winemaker here at St. Julian. We're going to be trying some four delicious wines from their selection. We're going to be serving in our local area from on premise and off premise restaurants and stores. So. So today we're going to start off with our 2010 Pinot Grigio. The 2010 harvest was nice and cool to start off. It was actually the latest harvest that we had here on record at St. Julian. And with that, the nice cool April, May, June, even into July that we had is great for ripening the Pinot Grigio. It keeps really high acids in the wine, so it's really near that Italian Grigio style. So it's very crisp, uh, very fruity with melon, honeydew, uh, very food friendly wine and it's quite enjoyable. The food friendly, this would pair very nice with grilled foods for the summer, spring, uh, vegetables, fish, very easy, like dry wine. It's real fresh. It's great with um, fresh foods. Obviously, with this time of year coming up, we've got fruits, vegetables coming around, right, picking fresh, so it's perfect. Next one we're going to be trying is St. Jay Riesling, a gold medal winner. Nancy, you can tell us about this. This is our 2010 St. Julian Riesling. Again, another gold medal winning wine that we have here. Um, 
2010 again was nice and cool which lends great weather growing uh, for our white varietals that we have here in Michigan and this is definitely a true attest to that cool climate that we had all through the summer months here in southwest Michigan. It's really fruity, has nice pineapple, mango, just delicious really ripe fruits that would go really well with a lot of foods that you can have in the summertime. Anybody would love that. This is my favorite wine to say. It's for the people that if you're not a wine drinker, it has a little bit of residual sugar behind it. But yet, if you're a dry wine drinker, if you chill it down, it's very enjoyable as well. So it's that versatile wine that it goes kind of towards everybody's palate. The next wine we're going to be trying is Bragany Reserve Trabinet. It's uh, one of um, Day Bragany's, which is Angela's father's pet projects. Uh, Nancy, tell us a little bit about this. Oh, our Bragany Reserve line, it's the, we take from smaller vineyards, um, smaller yields. It's the best of the best. You have, it has to qualify and taste just right for us to put the Bragnini name on it. So Dave and Angela, both of them actually are the ones that put their stamp of approval. Since it has their name, they're the ones that are proving that it is the best of the best. But another great wine that we have here, Traminette, some of you may not be familiar with it, but Gewürztraminer is its parent. So it's gonna have a lot of those Gewürztraminer characteristics to it. It's gonna be spicy and floral and still have some of those tropical fruits behind it. Again, a little bit of RS just to kind of round it out. Great with fruit tarts. Um, I love drinking this wine with pork, uh, pork on the grill, pork chops, anything along those lines. It's just a very versatile wine again, um, very food friendly like most of our wines here at St. Julian. Next one we're going to be trying is St. Julian Founders Red. Angela, who's this dapper looking fella on the label? This is my great great grandfather Marion Ongoconi. He started the winery in 1921 and last year for our 90th celebration and our anniversary we came out with this Founders Red to go with the family tradition and thank him for starting the company in such a great state. So a little bit about our Founders Red. Uh, this is a blend of the fruits of what South Mis West Michigan has to offer to us. So we have some Chamberson, some Chancellor in here, as well as some Vinifera varietals. We have a little bit of Merlot, Cabernet Franc, and Cabernet Sauvignon. So this is your everyday red wine. It's at a great price point. It's very easy to drink, not a whole lot of tannins, just a very smooth, food-friendly, nice red wine to enjoy. Anybody looking for an easy drinker red wine, I think this is it. Next wine we'll be trying is Forbidden Fruit Sangria, another great wine for the summertime. This sangria, it's already done. You don't have to cut up the fruit. You don't have to mix everything together and do all that. It's already done for you. Just a bit of fizz in there, and it's the traditional sangria with the oranges. Uh, you're going to get a lot of that citrus. So this wine, uh, we make it with some of the red wine varietals that we have here in Michigan, and we do the work for you, as Angela said. So it's really nice and fruity. Uh, I like to pour it over ice, maybe stick a wedge of lime in there if I have the opportunity and I have it available. But it's easy on the go. If you're going anywhere to the beach to a party, throw it in your cooler and enjoy it once you get there. Thanks. Cheers. If you're just joining us, we are at St. Julian Winery in Paw Paw, Michigan, located on the corner of Kalamazoo and Commercial Street. So far, we have seen one of the many beautiful vineyards they have. And now, it's time to step inside for some history, tours, and later, some tasting. Wineries love to show off their accolades and share them with their loyal customers. But let me tell you something, St. Julian Winery takes this to a completely new level. Angela Braganini and Joel Peterson are going to show us just a few of these many awards. Check this out. And we just moved into our exciting portion of the, the winery here with all the ribbons and plaques and, and um, the things hanging on the walls here. You know, I recently just heard that St. Julian is the most awarded um, winery in the Midwest. Yep, not only Michigan, but we're the most awarded winery in the Midwest. Uh, these are just a few examples of the medals that we've won. Um, these are the newest awards that we've taken in the last year. Um, we enter competitions all over the world, and one of the ones that we're most proud of is in 1998, we won Winery of the Year, the only state or the only winery outside of California to win. 
uh, Winery of the Year by Tasters Guild International. You know, I'm always uh, fascinated with um, people outside of Michigan has really accepted Michigan wines, St. Julian wines. People inside of Michigan kind of tend to you maybe not gravitate towards the Michigan wines, but obviously your award-winning wines coming right out of this location is fantastic. Yep, award-winning, and we're put against all the other wines throughout the whole country, so we really, we're very proud of what we're doing here. Certainly, St. Julian wines will stack up against any winery anywhere. Simply amazing, guys. Now, let's kick it back over to Nancy Oxley and Rick Collett for a behind-the-scenes look at the winemaking process. So the grapes are dumped outside into a nice large hopper and from there they're pumped into the winery into this machine and this is our crusher destemmer. Um, you can see that uh, this rotary arm is sitting out here. When the grapes come in this will spin and it'll actually knock all the grapes off of the stem. The stem will come out the end and we have a little colander type looking thing over uh, to the left of me and the grapes will shoot out the hole. From there they'll go into the press which is over my right shoulder over here. Uh, this is our 33 ton press that will press out in about two, two and a half hours depending on how much fruit we put in it. And we utilize this press for all of our white wine grape making. So our Rieslings will go through there, all the grapes that will go into Blue Heron will go through there. Now this process takes us to, you know, the wine cellar. Down here you've got a, quite a variety of different things going on. So. We do. This is our white wine barrel room. So part of St. Julian's history, this used to be the old Paw Paw Canning uh, mm -hmm. cannery. And so when St. Julian moved in, this made a perfect space for a barrel cellar. So now we're actually underneath the winery in the first basement, as we call it, which is our white uh, wine barrel room. And as you can see on the wall, the walls are lined with cork, so it keeps the natural humidity down here as well as the temperature. So the temperature and humidity never really fluctuate a whole lot, which is great for a barrel cellar. Yeah, Out in California, they have to use those little misters and temperature Yeah, I've control. never seen the cork wall. I mean, it keeps the moisture and things so that you do keep a nice constant condition. That's really a neat idea. You know, when you're talking about the barrels here, obviously you got all kinds of different ages of barrels too. We do. So these are some of our new barrels um, that we just recently purchased from St. Gumero. These are French oak barrels, uh, nicely stamped with our Bragnini Reserve. We do a mm -hmm. Bragnini Reserve mm -hmm. Chardonnay. Uh, so we have a couple French barrels. We also do American oak barrels. Most mm -hmm. of the American oaks coming from Indiana mm -hmm. and Kentucky. But one neat thing about St. Julian is we have a barrel program here that we may have Michigan oak barrels. So St. Julian started a Michigan oak barrel program a few years ago. So our chancellor is aged in 100% Michigan oak when it's and A lot of people think oak is oak. And it's, it's kind of fascinating that you get all the different kinds of oaks, the red oaks, the white oaks, and then oaks from different warmer climates, colder climates. You get different grain sizes in the oak and you get a completely different flavor coming out of them and I don't know if everybody knows but a lot of times in the barrels they, they actually are burned inside for what they call a toast. Hello everybody, well we've kind of moved along now, we've moved into the red room now so it's kind of a neat thing, we've got a lot of different barrels and things and like we're going to play around and try a few of them so I'll let Nancy kind of tell us what we've got here. Uh, this is our 2010 Cabernet Sauvignon so we're going to taste this. Uh, 2010, as I started earlier saying that it was really cool in the beginning of the year, well, it ended up being really, really warm at the end of the year. Perfect for ripening Cabernet Sauvignon. So we're going to taste this. It has really nice, dark, rich color. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to ripen Cabernet Sauvignon in Michigan, but I think we were spot on for 2010 with this wine. Yeah, it's really dark, got a lot of big depth and color. A lot of times, like I said, a little hard to ripen sometimes, so you don't get a lot of color sometimes. It's right. Oh, it's got a nice nose. Very. Yeah, full of juicy, deep red fruits, black cherries, yeah, black, black big raspberry. cherry and berry in there. A good tannins, dry but not too dry. Nice. Well, we thought we'd move along into the winery a little bit further, and we're going to try a different type of wine that some of you may not even be aware of is made here in Michigan. But uh, this is actually a port that they actually make here. A uh, little sweeter wine, everybody's kind of familiar with Portugal, uh, but there's some great ports made all over. Uh, this is a wine I've been drinking myself for years, so uh, um, I just really like this wine. It's a nice, everyday drinking port. So we keep our port separate vintages. So we have 2005 down here, 2006, 2007, and some 2010. We took mm -hmm, a couple years mm -hmm. off making it. And what we're tasting right now is our Chambersin port. Okay. So it's made out of Chambersin. We bring the grapes in. As soon as they start 
their fermentation, we fortify with brandy. So what you're tasting in here, the sweetness level is actually truly from that rich ripe grape that we ripened out in the sunshine of the vineyard. Okay. And so fortifying it with the brandy, that's where the alcohol comes okay. from. So to make Catherine's port, which this product is a part of, we blend several different vintages together, at least three. So. Okay. So now you got grapes plus port, what, I mean, plus, uh, plus brandy. Yep. What a deal. <laughs> you know, it's got good depth. It, it's not real syrupy. It's more body and structure. You know, it's got that good cherry background going on in the flavor and uh, with some good sweetness, but not an over-the-top sweetness. So for somebody that's a little afraid of really sweet thing, you don't have to worry about that with this. This is a really nice wine to be uh, sitting around after dinner to have, uh, if you're having a cup of coffee or having a little dessert or something as you go along, or uh, my other bad habit of having a cigar, this would be great with a cigar <laughs> sitting out. So I would enjoy this a lot. Um, so this is a young vintage. This is our 2010. Mm -hmm. So um, as pour ages over time, it'll kind of mellow out a little bit more in the bottle. It'll become mm -hmm. more integrated. So the sugar levels and the alcohol, the little bit of burn on the palate will actually integrate over time. And that's another reason why we blend vintage after vintage after vintage, mm -hmm. just to make a really nice, consistent product. So every time a customer purchases Catherine's Port, they taste like the same thing in the bottle. Well, that's nice because sometimes, you know, when you're getting into vintage, you know, the different vintage wines, you can go up and down in quality from year to year, but with this one, if you're using a little bit of the old, going into the new and keeping everything constant, you can guarantee yourself you get a nice bottle of wine every time. <laughs> now, a part of St. Julian Winery that doesn't have anything to do with wine. Seriously, check this out. Uh, well, we moved into a different part, and this is part of the, the operation that maybe nobody is even aware of uh, until a few years ago in Michigan. Um, you really didn't get a lot of distilled spirits. Uh, but now one of the things that the wineries have been kind of concentrating on a little bit more, more in the distilled spirits area, and we just got some great products here that we're taking a look at that St. Julian is now making. So why don't you tell us a little bit about them, Nancy, so you know we got them. All right, first of all, we have our A&G brandy. It is a cognac style brandy. So we bring in different grape varietals, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, it has a little bit of Vidal. And we load them into our still, distill it out. So something that a lot of people don't also know is that anything that comes off a still, any type of spirit comes off clear, just like vodka. In order to get this nice golden color, we need to age it in some oak barrels. So our A&G brandy is aged for at least 10 years in oak barrels, so it has a really nice, rich, round flavor. The last two years of aging, we age in our Slayer Cream Cherry Barrels. So it gives us this nice, really nutty sweetness to it almost that is just delicious on, on the palate. And then our other product that we have here is our gray heron vodka. It's vodka from grapes. In order to be vodka, it has to come off of our still at 190 proof, be clearless, colorless, and odorless. So a lot of people that stop in the winery say, hey, does that taste like grapes? Absolutely not. Vodka is odorless. So it is just vodka made from grapes, whereas some vodkas are made from potato or weed or some other items. We do ours solely from grapes that are grown here in Michigan. Now before that delicious wine makes it into those barrels that you saw earlier, it has to go through the fermentation process. And this is exactly where we're at now. Hey, well, yeah, one of the nice things I think right now that we're seeing in here too, I mean, we've moved into the, uh, the main fermentation room is really what we're in now. And uh, you can see how St. Julian continues to grow along with them. I mean, these are new state-of-the-art vats here. I mean, you're talking about you know, these right here, this area in here is all glycol cooled or warm, so you can actually change the temperature of everything inside. In the old days, you used to kind of have to rely on Mother Nature to take care of that or yeah. bury it in a cellar somewhere. We have this room, and we actually have uh, across the alley a room, a refrigerated tank, so our total capacity is 1.5 million gallons, which is huge for the Midwest. Yeah, that's a lot of wine. The last step of this process is what allows people from all over the country to enjoy this delicious wine. Of course, I mean the bottling room. Well, hello everybody, we've uh, kind of stepped into a little bit of another area here now. A really a little noisier, a little bit more to it. We're in the bottling room at St. Julian, and they're actually bottling a brand new wine for them. So I'll let Nancy tell us about it. Hi, today we're bottling our St. Julian Late Harvest Riesling.
my thing that's really kind of an interesting thing is this whole idea of the nitrogen hit at the end just to seal it so you get that oxygen out of there that really is a, the enemy of the wine. And you're right, I mean, I'm seeing more and more of the screw cap structures. They're really good product lines now. They do a really good job for everything. But, uh, you know, it's kind of neat to see everything from things going into the, the empty bottles coming off all the way through and going right back in the same box in the end. So. I'd like to take this moment to thank everyone involved that made this episode possible. This has been such a great behind the scenes look at how our Michigan wines are made and what it really takes to produce a quality wine. I'm sure your level of appreciation has grown, so go out and pick up a bottle of our Michigan made St. Julian wine. You won't be disappointed. Until next time, be safe, drink responsibly, and enjoy your wine. Cheers.